depart from the easiest and most appealing storylines, which are either the, you know, AI is all good or AI is all bad uh, storylines, and also take a more nuanced view of what the whole field of artificial intelligence is, that it's not one, uh, the, the, you know, the most recent technology, but there's really many parts of it that all fit together. Maintaining this diversity of inquiry, this sort of big tent view of what are the technologies that go into artificial intelligence is very important um, for people within the field. And I think it's you know, an important for people telling the story about AI to, to maintain an awareness that AI is not just one thing that, that gets applied, but really is a, a broad um, set of technologies and set of, of um, problems. My research here is focused on, broadly speaking, autonomy. How can we get um, autonomous agents, they could be robots, they could be software agents, to be able to operate on their own um, in a dynamically changing world. So to be able to perceive their environment, whatever that environment happens to be, to be able to decide what actions to take, and then to be able to actually execute those actions in a closed loop such that their the actions that they take affect their future perceptions. And so there's, um, there's sort of fundamental computer science or artificial intelligence algorithms behind every step of that chain. Um, some of them machine learning based, in particular a type of machine learning known as reinforcement learning is where I have focused my research uh, efforts most prominently within machine learning. And I also feel like a big part of autonomy is being able to interact with other agents, maybe other people or other robots or software agents. And so that brings me to the field of multi-agent systems. And so I've been always very interested throughout my research of the interaction between um, multiple agents and machine learning and how those uh, go hand in hand. Yeah, so the application area that I'm uh, most known for is robot soccer. I've been a, a part of the, um, the International RoboCup Federation, which has just had the 21st um, annual international event, um, where every year we have um, people from around the world bringing robots or simulated agents together to compete in a sort of academic style competition um, where everybody is, uh, in, in many cases, it's in a soccer domain. We say that the goal is by the year 2050 to have a team of fully autonomous humanoid robots that can beat the best World Cup champion on a real soccer field. Um, but also within RoboCup, we look at uh, broader applications um, and uh, such as there's an effort called RoboCup at Home, which is trying to get robots to interact with people in a domestic environment. We participated in that, uh, in that event this year. There's a RoboCup Rescue where um, it focuses on robots, multiple robots interacting with one another in disaster settings, um, such as after earthquakes or uh, hurricanes or things like that. Um, there's a Ro RoboCup Industrial. So there's it's sort of a very broad uh, set of applications. I'm right now the vice president of the RoboCup Federation. I've uh, been involved in this domain since I was a graduate student back in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, so that's sort of one long-standing domain I've been involved in. Um, another example domain that I've uh, spent a lot of time in is autonomous bidding agents or trading agents. These are all software. They're not robots. But again, um, engaging in... Uh, sort of economic activity, buying and selling goods, and this is fundamentally a multi-agent interaction. There's multiple intelligent agents that have to interact with one another. There's room for learning. Um, so that's a, a domain I've looked at. And another is autonomous driving. If you're trying to get a car to be able to drive on the road, um, I've been involved in that as an application domain since 2003. Now, of course, every, a lot of people are thinking about it. But from the beginning, I've seen it as a, as a great testbed for machine learning and multi-agent systems because there's not going to be just a single car on the road. There'll be many. They have to interact with one another. There's lots of very interesting research problems that arise. Do you feel change has accelerated in these domains that you're working on? For example, that for a long time, not that much has happened, but all of a sudden we see all these breakthroughs. Well, so there's a perception that nothing happened for a long time. And in fact, you know, the field of AI, um, there's the perception of the field of AI, and then there's the sort of reality from within the trenches. And really, it's, um, you know, the story is one, from my perspective, of steady, uh, steady incremental progress over the past 50 or 60 years. Um, the field pushing new algorithms, new application areas. From um, 
the perspective of results or uh, sort of business applications, there have definitely been fits and starts. There have been times when um, everybody's using the, the latest uh, artificial intelligence techniques and, uh, and it sort of becomes a part of the standard um, business arsenal. Um, and then, you know, typically what happens is the things that used to be called, considered artificial intelligence become sort of um, assimilated into technology. People stop thinking of them as AI because AI has this um, sort of uh, lore or, or sense that it's always, it's the things that we can't get computers to do yet. And so it's always this thing that is just a little beyond what we can do. And then, you know, so... Um, the old applications sort of uh, saturate, we, we, and um, they, their uses are, you know, remain in industry, but then, you know, they can't do as much as people hoped. And so there's this perception then that nothing is happening. But really from within the field, there's still a lot of, of progress. And then we get to another tipping point where all of a sudden there's enough data and computation and the algorithms are right for a new set of applications. That's happened recently. And so there's a real big frenzy around AI right now. Um, but the, you know the sense is that at least from within that that this is just part part of an ongoing cycle that that you know um, there's some uh, a lot of um, capabilities that that are now possible and those will last they'll be they'll have a long standing impact um, but the field will keep will keep moving on there's some things that the current algorithms and current uh, state of the art is not able to to do and so that will become the new focus of the field of AI and the things that it that, you know that are currently being assimilated into technology will start to become you know seen as business as usual and that's sort of a both a um, it's uh, you know both uh, an exciting thing about AI. There's always new things to work on, and it's a little bit of a curse because um, it means that you know that you always have to come up with new things. The stuff you you were working on before um, becomes old news very quickly. Do you feel artificial intelligence is somewhat misunderstood by most people today? Yeah, I mean the you know the history of AI has always been sort of a bipolar one. The, the, the public perception of it that there's you know, people who think of it as a as you know a all good thing. It's going to lead to utopia, solve all of our problems. Everything will be, uh, you know, will be great. We'll have le all leisure time. That's one of the sort of um, ways that AI is perceived in the press and in the in the literature and in movies and things. The other is the complete opposite: the dystopian perspective that it's going to destroy the world, that it's going to to lead to people becoming obsolete, and and you know, rare, rarely do do uh, you get the storyline in between. It, does, it doesn't make nearly as good a story to, to be more balanced. And, um, but you know, the reality is that there's, just like any other technology, there's, there's a lot of potential benefits, but it's, you know, at least with the current algorithms that we have, it's not gonna solve all the world's problems. Um, there are some risks. But again, at least with the technology we have now, there's not a danger that it's going to destroy the world. Um, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, and it's all about how the technology is used. Most, most technologies can be used for good or for evil. Um, it's, a, you know, it's also how the people um, behind it choose to use it. And, um, you know, th that's no different than any other, than any other technology, really. What's your take on these efforts to infuse machines with proper ethics and ethical ground rules? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it's more about infusing people who are using AI with the sense of, of knowledge of what its risks and benefits are, uh, with the ethics of, of what you know, should and shouldn't be done with the technology. It's not that it needs to be given to the machines. It needs to be, you know, people need to understand the impact of training a model with biased data um, and, you know, what that, can, what that can lead to and, you know, the psychology of it. These are all things that, that I think are the burden of people. We can't, we're not at a point where, um, where you know, we can just offload that to the machines. It's, it's still the responsibility of the users of the technology to use it in the right way. Do you think the potential and the abilities of artificial intelligence are maybe overestimated? Um, I think there's some of both. There's some people who are overly enthusiastic and overly, you know, there's very high expectations about uh, what AI can do. And that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, there's, there's a natural effect. This always happens is that, you know, when there's a landmark result like uh, beating the, the world champion in Go or getting really good results at image recognition, both things that have happened recently, 
people tend to say, oh, wow, that, that's, that's something that a computer can do better than I can do. Therefore, the computer can probably do everything else I can do. Um, but the fact is that you know, a computer that can beat the world Go champion or chess champion or Jeopardy champion isn't able to fold your laundry. Folding your laundry is a much you know, more difficult task in some ways, easier in other ways. And um, you know, the, people tend to, to forget that it's, for a long time, machines have been better than people at certain things, right? I mean, for years, you know, decades, um, computers have been better than people at arithmetic, right? You'd never want to get into a multiplication contest with a calculator or a computer. Um, and yet, people, when that happened, maybe that led to sort of existential questions of will people become obsolete? And people then quickly understood what the limits of a calculator are. And I think you know, this kind of fallacy repeats itself. Every time computers can do something that, that, um, that people were better at before, people quickly jump to the conclusion that everything else is about to fall as well. And it's, it's not the case. There's, there's over-enthusiasm from that perspective. Every, every application area, every new capability requires years of dedicated uh, research and development. And, um, and so we're still, we're a long way off from, and you know, arguably, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not clear that it will ever happen, that computers will be better than people at everything. Though, you know, other, there are people who project, they will always project that that's only 10 years away or 30 years away. And that's, from my perspective, always is, uh, is very over-enthusiastic. Yeah. So what's your view on this singularity that some people predict? That's not, I mean, the, the definition of the singular, singularity of, of is sort of relies on this notion that, that, you know, as soon as you get to the point of there being more computation in a computer than there is in a human brain, that all of a sudden everything the brain can do, the computer can do. And I think that's a, um, that's a big leap. Mm -hmm. Many people seem very hung up on this idea, though. I mean, there's many books about possible yep. dangers. It's very, it's a very enticing, it's a very uh, enticing line of argument. It's very appealing, but I think it's, it's not where we should be focusing our energy right now. It's not something that's on the, um, you know, uh, I think it was Andrew Ng who first said that it's, you know, worrying, worrying about computers destroying the world is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars, right? There's so far to get to the point of even being able to do the thing, the, the things that would lead to the danger um, that, you know, we, we should focus our energy on, on the, the capabilities. And there's a lot of, I think, excitement um, around still understanding what are the limits of, of computation? What is it the computers can do? What can't they do? What are the algorithms for making, making computers and more intelligent? Um, and, you know, it's, I think uh, that, that's where we should be focusing our energy. Have you had any surprises recently in your research uh, with artificial intelligence? Yeah, well, I think that's, I mean, that is part of the, there's, well, first of all, within the, um, the RoboCup competitions that I go to every year, every year there's a surprise in some, one of the leagues or another. There's always, you know, sort of a leap in performance one way or another, or, you know, a new design or, or but I think, you know, this happens in, um, you know, there's, there's sort of small surprises in lots of different areas. Um, People were predicting that it would take a lot longer than it did to, to reach the levels of uh, playing that, that AlphaGo did. So that was a that was a surprise. It had been predicted that it would take um, longer. Some of the you know a lot of the the very impressive results in uh, from deep neural networks in vision recognition in in image captioning in um, in sort of supervised learning of many different types where there's lots of data available. They've been very impressive and uh, and I think surprising to everybody how how robust they've been. And uh, so that's really what's causing a lot of the excitement right now is that that's unlocked a lot of um, potential business applications, potential you know sort of real world applications that just simply weren't possible before. Um, and uh, you know I think there's uh, there's limits to what this, these lead to, but there's still a lot of um, settling out to see what are those what those limits are. And um, you know, and so that's sort of where the cycles usually happen. They'll know, they'll be need to be a concerted push to to get to the next level in some new application domain. Um, and there's you know, but there, and there's still, like I say, many uh, many areas where um, a lot of research still needs to be done.
you worked on a study about the impact of artificial intelligence over the next hundred years. So what kind of surprises do you think are on the horizon? Right. Well, I think some of the surprises, and, and the idea of the AI 100 study was to predict 15 years in advance, 2030, with the idea that that's sort of the horizon at which predictions are potentially uh, you know, with uh, more than guesses. Um, if you start going beyond that, at least with the rate of technology change these days, it's really hard to have any confidence. Um, I think some of the surprises may be uh, you know, of the negative variety right now at this point, that, that uh, you know, there's a lot of optimism about, um, about self-driving cars, and I do think that the technology is there, um, but it always still does seem like it's, uh, you know, the technology in some sense has been there for decades already. Uh, the, the demonstrations of cars driving themselves began in the late 1980s. Um, and, uh, you know, it's still not the point that to the point where people are ready to adopt them. And so it may be surprising to people at this point how long it'll take before you know, all, the roads on, all the cars on the road are autonomous. It could still happen very quickly. I wouldn't be shocked if it did, but I also wouldn't be shocked if it plays out over a, a longer period than, than people are currently expecting. Um, in terms of opportunities coming forwards, you know, the, the, uh, one of the recent really big breakthroughs or, or landmarks have been, have been the performance in computer vision and natural language processing. But I think there's still a lot of room in a, a number of different areas. Um, first of all, there's uh, a lot of capability now at understanding single utterances or single sentences, but having meaningful dialogues back and forth, like extended conversations and all of the sort of context of, of common sense knowledge that that requires, um, I think there's still, um, there's still a lot of research to be done there. And if and when we get to the point of, of being able to, to have extended natural language dialogues, that will lead to another sort of, um, uh, sort of floodgate being opened in terms of applications that are possible. And uh, another is, you know, in, in robotics, there's a lot of ability right now for robots to navigate autonomously, sort of on wheels, starting to be uh, on legs a little bit, or to operate in factories in sort of controlled environments. But to be able to manipulate objects in an open and dynamic environment, there's still a lot of room for improvement there, especially in an affordable way. There are, there's starting to be impressive demonstrations of manipulation, but still with very expensive technology. Um, so when, when, if and when we get to a point of being able to ro have robots robustly manipulate objects with uh, affordable uh, actuators, affordable arms, that will also unlock a, a large set of applications. And I think you know, um, it's hard to imagine what, what kind of um, surprises will emerge when, if and when we get to that point. We make the point strongly in, in the AI100 report that there are um, potential benefits, potential risks um, of artificial intelligence, that there's barriers towards getting from where we are to realizing the full benefits. Um, I, for one, wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I weren't really excited about the positive possible impacts of artificial intelligence in the future. I think there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of exciting potentials in the future, and, uh, and that's why I'm dedicating my career to, to trying to discover new algorithms and push forward the state of the art in artificial intelligence. What would you like to see improve, maybe in the approach that uh, people take or that the press and the media take yeah. to artificial intelligence? So I think, you know, with the external, like the press and the, you know, I think should, should try to uh, make an effort to, to understand, first of all, to, to depart from the easiest and most appealing storylines, which are either the, you know, AI is all good or AI is all bad uh, storylines, and also um, to, to take a more nuanced view of what the whole field of artificial intelligence is, that it's not one, uh, the, the, you know, the most recent technology, but there's really many parts of it that all fit together. Um, and I think that's also, you know, a similar lesson for, uh, for the practitioners, for the, for the researchers, that, you know, there's a tendency when there's a technique that, that works and an algorithm that works, people tend to gravitate towards it, jump on the bandwagon, sometimes at the expense of continuing to explore some of the other promising areas. And, you know, for example, right now, neural networks are really on top of that heap. Everybody's gravitating towards that. But there was a, you know, there was a time when people viewed neural networks as a sort of a has-been technology without a future, and if um, you know it was due to a set of, of 
a small group of dedicated people who kept that thread of, of technology and development moving forwards that led to where we are today. I think there's other areas right now in AI that are, that are in danger of being neglected because they're not as, as hot as, as neural networks, but that are going to lead to the breakthroughs in the future. And so maintaining this diversity of inquiry, this sort of big tent view of what are the technologies that go into artificial intelligence is very important um, for the people within the field. And I think it's you know, an important for people telling the story about AI to, to maintain an awareness that AI is not just one thing that, that gets applied, but really is a, a broad um, set of technologies and set of, of um, problems.